Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you. Uh, if you hear a little bit of an echo, Arlene and I are at the Achieving the Dream conference. Actually, so is Tiffany and so is Winnie. Uh, so we're taking a step out from our time down at Dream 2024 uh, for this critical conversation. So first and foremost, thank you as always for joining us today uh, and taking the time. I'm excited about the topic. It's incredibly relevant considering the fact that we are at Achieving the Dream and talking a lot about how we can really meet the equity agenda at the institution. Uh, and certainly the topic today is going to really focus on all of that. And I'm really excited for you to hear about the work that's being done. Uh, first, I just want to remind you, Beth, if you can just run through a few slides for me, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I really want to thank you all for taking the time to show up or participate with me in the open door days. These are the remaining dates that are available over the course of this year. Um, what we're trying to do now is we, we used to try to do this so we identify whether it was Bedford or Lowell uh, or Zoom. Um, that didn't work. So now, now we're on to a new approach here where you sort of tell us whether you want to be, what campus you're going to be on, and I'll go back and forth between Bedford and Lowell uh, for a morning or an afternoon, and we'll schedule you accordingly. Or if Zoom is more convenient, we'll do that as well. But really want to appreciate the people who have spent some time with me uh, I get to meet every new employee, but the opportunity to talk with a lot of you about what's going on in your own areas and to hear about areas of improvement for the college is really important. So thank you. So please consider making an appointment if there's something that you'd like to bring up or something you'd like to talk about, or if you have an idea that you'd like to share, uh, it would be great to hear from you. It's that time of year again. I want to remind you that uh, all faculty and staff will be involved in the commencement exercises that are coming up in May. Uh, but if you are going to be marching and not volunteering for the day, uh, I want to flip back. There we go. Then you have access to a QR code there where you can go ahead and order your faculty and staff regalia while you are sitting here today. That only takes a couple of seconds. You can fill it out. Uh, you also can email Angela Richardson. Uh, if you have your own regalia so that you will not need to be ordering just whatever we need to know so that you are prepared uh, for the biggest day on campus, which is commencement day coming up in May. So it's that time to order. So if you pay attention to that, it would be really important to get those orders in uh, in the next few weeks while you have time. We'll be reminding you periodically to take care of that responsibility. Uh, the next slide is really an announcement, a very exciting one. Uh, you'll notice there are a lot of crystal awards there. Um, so we have been noted as one of five institutions in the United States. Yep, that's right. Five community colleges in the United States who is a finalist for the Excellence in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Institutional Equity and Belonging Award. Um, it is something that uh, I think is really a testament to all of the work that all of the people that are on this Zoom and all the people across the campus, faculty, staff, and our students and our student peer mentors, et cetera, have been doing at the institution. Uh, this application identifies holistically all of the amazing equity and belonging work that has been going on at Middlesex for more than a decade now. I'm very excited about this recognition. Uh, we will go to AACNC, AACC in April we won't know until we get there whether we're going to win the award. So it will be, uh, but just being nominated is really important. Isn't that what they say in the Academy Awards? Just, just being nominated is, is really a, a testimony to the work. So wanted you to have that first announcement. We'll be pushing out press releases about this, about uh, this amazing uh, award and nomination, and we'll get that out to you um, as soon as we're done. I also would like to identify, I think I have one more slide, Beth. There you go. So today you're going to hear from the amazing student affairs staff and people who are not directly teaching in the classroom every day. Um, and they're going to talk about their experience with the pedagogy of real talk and the work with Dr. Paul Hernandez and his book and his approach to how we interact with students and the importance of sort of vulnerability and planning in terms of how we can share our own experiences with students and how that makes them feel better connected to us as individuals and the community. What I do wanna recognize here, we'll be doing this more formally on professional day 
is that we are now in our, our fourth cohort of folks that have been involved in the faculty academy. This is no small feat. Each and every one of these faculty members has a leader that you'll see highlighted there in blue, Vikram and Lara, Eloisa and Benur, who have been leading these cohorts, along with all the faculty that have engaged and committed to a three-year effort to build pedagogy of real talk, the PRT work directly into their classrooms. And I wanna thank them again for their commitment to this effort. It's really amazing that we are in our fourth cohort. Uh, we are one of the few colleges across the country that have really embedded uh, Dr. Hernandez's work into everything that we do. And I'm excited for you to hear about the amazing work that our student affairs professionals, our people outside of the classroom and how they're applying this work to what they do every day to better serve students. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Winnie so she can begin the presentation. We're gonna make sure, of course, that we leave opportunities for your comments and questions at the end. But I think Winnie's got a whole staff of folks that are gonna be involved in this presentation. So you're gonna to to hear from all of them. And I'm really excited for them to share their research and the implications of that research with all of you. So take it away, Winnie. Thank you, Phil. And thank you everyone for making the time to attend this um, session. So thank you everyone. Thank you for making the time to attend this critical conversation session brought to you by the first MCC staff pedagogy real talk cohort. Now, before I delve into this presentation of the belonging survey data, I would like to share with you my own personal story of why belonging is really important to me. I came to the US in 2006. When I was back home in Kenya, America was often described as a melting pot. When I moved here and lived here, one of the things that I learned and experienced is that America is more often a port of difference that doesn't always melt together. Now, this is most obvious in workplaces that serve diverse clients, like higher education, and Middlesex is one of those places, yet, Research confirms that human beings are wired to thrive in relationship-rich environments where they find a community that they belong to. Interestingly enough, some places, unintentionally or not, do strive to create relationship-rich spaces that meld these differences together and create an environment where people from all walks of life feel like, feel a sense of belonging. I was lucky that I found that place. 9,000 miles away from my home country, Kenya, at Salem State University. I left Kenya on December 31st, 2005, and I landed in Boston on January 1st, 2006. I remember those dates very clearly. And I came here to begin my graduate studies as an international student. As an international student, you have to report to the international student's office so that ICE doesn't come after you. When I landed at the international student's office and introduced myself, I will not forget this day. Reiko Morris, the Japanese office manager, almost literally scared me back into, my, into the car when she shouted excitedly, Winnie, you're here. And you are going to work for me because I desperately need your email communication skills. Apparently, the communication that I had been having with her 9,000 miles away from Kenya piqued her interest. This was my welcome into American higher education. I didn't realize that my language skills from an English speaking African country would be valuable in an American office. My past knowledge and experiences were validated and valued from day one, and I cannot tell you how good it felt. Over my the three years that I was at Salem State, I worked as a graduate assistant in various offices. And through those offices, I managed to work with Brazilian, Moroccan, Lebanese, Swedish, Filipino, American, Chinese, different types of students. I learned about their culture, I ate their food, experienced the nuances of their languages, but most importantly, I actually found a space where being different was valued and embraced. I felt seen, I felt heard, I felt welcomed. And think about it. I was 9,000 miles away from home, but I had literally found a family that I belonged to. I literally felt like I had hit the graduate school jackpot. I did not realize how impactful my experience at Salem State was until after I graduated. And like everybody else, you start receiving those calls, emails, and postcards from the foundation office requesting for donations. Now, 
while every other donation request ended up in the trash and opened. Interestingly enough, all of the requests from Sound State, I never threw them out. I literally pinned them on the board and was always compelled to respond with a donation. And I didn't realize why. But later on, as I started being part of the pedagogy of real talk, I realized that it was because of the sense of belonging I had experienced at Salem State. I experienced it at the international student's office where I worked, at the tutoring offices where I worked. I got the moral academic support and validation from my graduate school advisors and English faculty. The result was that even though I was 9,000 miles away from home, I had literally found a relationship-rich environment that made me feel seen. I felt heard, I felt valued and validated. I was Salem State University. Now, let me bring that back to us at Middlesex. Imagine being a new student at Middlesex and on your first day, someone tells you that who you are and what you bring with you is important and valuable. That during your time here, you are surrounded by impactful and meaningful relationships with staff, with faculty, with other students that make you feel seen, you feel heard, and you feel valued. This is the experience I want for every student who walks into our campuses, offices, departments, and classes, that regardless of where they are at MCC, they feel seen, they feel heard, they feel valued. Next slide, please. Now, why is sense of belonging important? If you ask any business, they will tell you that their survival depends on both repeat and returning customers. They will also tell you that once you get a customer, you need to invest in keeping them. For us at Middlesex, that means retaining the students that we admit. This is literally how we are going to survive the enrollment cliff that researchers say is coming in 2025. Now I did a little bit of research myself and inside of higher education say that the number of traditional age, college age students will peak in 2025 and then decline for a few years. But more concerning than that is that among those 18 to 24 year olds, fewer are choosing to go to college. The National Center for Education Statistics that tracks the number of high school graduates who enroll at a two or four year school, the October after they graduate high school, say that between 2016 and 2021, that rate declined from 70 to 60%, 62%. Why? I think we are all aware that the American public is increasingly skeptical about the value of higher education, especially if they have to take a loan to get it. Now I'm going to give you three specific examples about schools that are facing the reality of this decline in enrollment. West Virginia University in September of 2023, not too long ago, faced a 45 million gap. They cut 28 degree programs. They laid off 140 faculty. UMass Lowell, our neighbor on November, 2023, faced a 37 million gap. They froze 60 positions, reduced the operating budget by 15%, but they still had to lay off 23 staff. University of New Hampshire, two miles from my house, in January of 2024, this year, had faced a 14 million gap. They went from having an enrollment, the highest enrollment of 13,558 in fall of 2017 to 11,716 in fall of 23. The shortfall was about 1,842 students in just five years. The conclusion is that the fight for the few to 18 to 24 year olds who will choose to attend college is going to be stiff. The higher education market, on the other hand, does, has no lack of options on where and how the students can, go, can do college. However, MCC has a very, very important value proposition. And this value proposition can set us apart from the competition. And that is creating a relationship-rich environment that students can, cannot find at another community college or four-year school or online program. You and I could be that relationship-rich environment that convinces a student to actually come to MCC and stay to graduation because they have finally found a place where they feel seen, they feel heard, they feel validated, they have experienced a sense of belonging. Now, 
When I talk about sense of belonging, I learned about this through the pedagogy of real talk. I had experienced it, but I really didn't know how to put words to it. This is what I learned through the pedagogy of real talk. The other thing that I learned is strategies through which I can intentionally build sense of belonging with students. In fall of 2023, in order to determine the impact of having four years, we're going on to five, of PRT trained staff and faculty, we decided to develop a survey to assess students' sense of belonging. You will find out the response was overwhelming, the results are very revealing, and basically, they still work to do. We have work to do, especially as we experience the increase of mass reconnect students. These are students who may have had negative experiences, negative experiences with higher education before, and have only been convinced to re return because of financial aid. Now, I can only imagine how much more sense of belonging would be to an adult student who already feels different being in a class with 18 to 20 year olds. And do not forget, even these Mass Reconnect students, they have options. But MCC has a value proposition that if you come to Middlesex, you will experience a relationship rich environment from day one through graduation. We are already doing it, but we can do it even better. But this can only happen when you and I agree to intentionally create and maintain that relationship rich environment in each of our spaces. My, our goal today is by the end of this session, you will agree with me that we want to be an institution of staff and faculty who acknowledge the importance of a relationship rich environment that leads to students feeling a sense of belonging. And with that, I am going to hand over to Kayla to get us now into the data. Thank you, Winnie. I have the pleasure of introducing the first staff um, cohort of PRT. Um, we have Winnie starting on the left, myself, Kayla, Johanka, Rina, Jeff, Faye, Christine, Beth, and Vera. And as you can see, we're across many disciplines at MCC, enrollment, advising, trio, career, registrar, admissions. Um, so, you know, the one thing that we have in common is we, we want to be change makers. We've set some goals, they're pretty lofty goals, and we're really starting with trying to measure and cultivate um, this belief that belonging is impactful and needed for both students and employees at Middlesex. So Winnie's done a great job at looking at and identifying belonging as a key indicator for student success and persistence. So next, I'm going to dive into how our PRT team has set out to measure belonging among our students at MCC. So we developed a survey, and to develop the survey that captured belonging accurately, we pulled some peer-reviewed questions from the Psychological Sense of School Membership Scale, see Good Now 1993. And we also leaned heavily on the Pedagogy of Real Talk, second edition, Hernandez 2022, and the impact of sense belonging in college, um, Betram and Henning 2022. Um, we wanted to select questions geared specifically towards a student climate of belonging measurement. Um, we collaborated to narrow our questions down to specifically five. Um, we really wanted to ascertain and benchmark this data moving forward because you'll see we want to repeat it each term. Um, and that's how we started developing the survey. So the survey went out to about 5,500 students this October 2023. Um, we used a five-point Likert scale, strongly agree, somewhat agree, neither agree or disagree, somewhat disagree or strongly disagree. We also incorporated an open text for four of the five questions to obtain a little bit more feedback. Um, a link was sent to um, the Qualtrics survey via text. Um, we also sent it out via email, and then we also utilized the Blackboard system. We had an, an incredible response rate of 2,324 students. So about a 44% response rate from this survey. So with that, we, um, you know, we benchmarked our 2023 um, fall PRT climate survey data. Um, and digging into each, into each area, we have an incredible IR team here at MCC. Shout out to um, Ryan Johnson and Nayeb Kizme 
Um, they included filters with our data so that we could disaggregate the um, responses by identifiers like age, gender, race, ethnicity, and earned credits. So in doing that, we were able to dig down into the data and we could find um, various correlations in student response on the survey and some student profile characteristics. Ryan and Nayab also assisted with organizing some of the open-ended responses because we had so many into some centralized theme buckets. Um, and with the obtained results, we, you know, we, we, we hope to use this data moving forward um, in future survey comparison. Our hope that our work on, um, on connection and belonging continues across campus, and we'll start to see a positive impact or an upward trend reflected in the student responses each year we repeat this survey. So now diving into the actual results, in prompt one, it is hard for people like me to be accepted as a part of the MCC community. The results showed that 75% of the students disagreed um, with this statement. So about 75% of students who responded didn't, um, don't find it hard to be accepted at the, as a part of the MCC community. But where results got really impactful is with the narrative information we got back from this round. Um, we got a lot of reoccurring statements or emergent themes as we've start, started calling them. Things like isolation, discrimination, um, fear of judgment, repeat submissions over and over. In question two, there's at least one faculty or staff member in this school I feel connected to. 68% of students agree to this statement or somewhat agree to this statement. About 20% of students responded with ambivalence. 13% of students disagreed with this statement. Um, so this is definitely that 68%, that's a possible area of intervention that we'll discuss further in the presentation. Um, and question three, I feel connected to M the MCC community through one or more of the following. Activities, clubs, events, affinity groups or social groups. 47% of students selected strongly agree or somewhat agree. Again, this is another area of of high impact potential. The narrative responses we got were just incredible. We got dozens of suggestions of um, things that students would love to participate in, clubs, events, affinity groups, um, great information we got back from this one. Uh, question four results. In question four, I don't feel safe being my authentic self when interacting with the MCC community in or outside of the classroom. 77% of stu students strongly or somewhat disagree with this statement. This is um, great feedback, but we definitely have room for improvement. Again, the narrative data we got back was incredible. Emergent themes like being misunderstood, fear of being discriminated against, retaliation or harm, and failure were submitted for some of the open responses. And our last prompt was, I am treated with as much respect as other students. 92% of our respondents did indicate that they are either strongly or somewhat in agreement with this statement. So when we took it the, uh, look at the narrative responses and the information we got back, um, students shared um, themes of communication that they would like more direct outreach, um, more direct communication, and they would like faculty and staff to start fostering an environment a little less judgmental. So in the next section, we're gonna go ahead and delve into some of the emergent themes and look at what we can do individually and as an institution to prove our, uh, improve our climate of belonging. And really, as Winnie pointed out, staying competitive in a market where there are endless options for students to go right now. Um, we'll explore some small changes we can make every day um, that can make a huge impact. We can look at some uh, other professional goals you can partner with um, and explore at MCC um, and really start to work on goal setting for your next year that maybe has an influence of belonging or connection. Uh, we ask that you guys uh, hang on to any questions until after this next segment and then we'll circle back and make sure that we have time for any questions. Thank you, Kayla. We will now transition to our panel discussion with our three MCC colleagues. My name is Christine Bell and I'll be the panel moderator for this part. The three areas we discuss are key components of impacting belonging at our institution. We wanna build upon our successes and we want students to feel that they matter. 
I will now have each of our panelists introduce themselves by sharing an About Me slide. Go ahead, Maria. Thanks, Christine. Um, so this is me, Maria McDuffie Clark. Uh, they, they're them pro pronouns. Um, I think part of my little um, slide got missed here, but that's okay. I, I can tell you three fun facts about myself, but it's really all in the photos. Um, that top left corner is uh, the, the proud generation of women in my family, um, from my great grandmother to my grandmother and my mother here. Um, and it's kind of funny because I'm, I'm had the generation of of men that I, I am creating right now there with my son. Um, so I am a new mother and I'm an expecting mother um, of a new baby boy. So uh, that is who I am on my priority basis, uh, just a, a really great mom. Um, but also I am originally from North Carolina, but a blow-in um, to Lowell. I came up here and just never left. Um, I put the hashtag, there's a lot to like a lot about, about Lowell because I, I just, I, I can't escape it. the the community that I felt here, the belonging that I felt here. Um, and mostly too, to these folks um, down in the corner um, who are mentors of mine uh, in, in Lowell. And um Laura Smith and Maria Cunha and, and Mulvey, who also taught me at uh, UMass Lowell. So um, that's what brought me up from North Carolina is the UMass Lowell um, Community Social Psych Program. Uh, I did take a slight vacation there for a few years, a year and a half maybe. Uh, so I'm back at Middlesex. I am not um, new to Middlesex, but new to this role as the Director of uh, Student Engagement for Equity. Um, and then there on the top right corner is me and my husband. I am, uh, we are very big um emo rock fans. So that is us at our, our best um, enjoying ourselves. So um, that is me in a nutshell. Um, I will also say that right there in the middle is uh, Spot the Robo Dog, um, which uh, Chancellor Jen came in with when she was inaugurated, which is really fun. Um, so I got to be kind of in my vacation time at UMass Lowell, uh, kind of hanging out with the handler for the Spot the Dog. So I get to have fun in my job. I know what it means to belong um, and how people can like kind of bring you in and welcome them. So thank you. Hi, I'm Jamie March. I'm the Director of Student Access and Support Services, SAS. Um, it was fun to make a slide, although hard to pick things because I have lots of things that I love. Uh, top one is definitely anything to do with animals. I volunteer at a zoo doing conservation education. I have um, two dogs. You can kind of see them there and that one little one big. Um, if I had my way, I would have all the animals, alpacas, cows, chickens, bats, an axolotl, you name it. Um, the list goes on. I was born and raised in Massachusetts, about 10 minutes from Boston. Uh, so city girl, I live with the cows now, but that's great. Uh, I have one adult daughter. You can see that a little picture of me, my wife, my daughter, and then my grandbaby Phoenix. That's him and the little star there. Um, so I have lots of things I love to do, read, go to plays, listen to music. I like to play board games. I own about 300 board games at my house. So we have uh, quite a collection. Uh, and I'm excited to be able to be part of the panel today. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Ladano. Uh, here I am. My current role is director of the Success Scholars Program, but I've been at MCC since 2016 in a variety of other part-time roles before this one. Um, born and raised in Ohio, left for college and never went back. And I really, really like the beach. Here's myself uh, getting married to my husband. We're coming up on 10 years this August. So it's hard to believe that was 10 years ago. Uh, my son Cameron is uh, turning six next week. And we've tried to go to Disney quite a few times. We're actually gonna go this weekend. So looking forward to that. So there he is. And then in the other time that I have, I spend that coaching cheerleading. I've been coaching cheerleading for over 15 years. I didn't put my current team on the slide, but my current team that I'm coaching is actually UMass Lowell. So I've transitioned to college cheer coach. So that's pretty much me. And thank you uh, for letting me be on the panel. 
thank you all for introducing yourself and sharing who you are. It was really nice to get to know the person behind the position. Um, Kayla, if you could just stop sharing the slides for this first question. So question one, I'm gonna start with it. This will be answered by all three panelists. What role does your area play in belonging? And what key roles and functions do you fill at MCC with regards for belonging? And I think I'll just take that one first because it's it's just the easiest. Um, it's one that I was excited to um, be a part of as in this role uh, for student engagement. Um, it, engagement means your college experience. It means uh, expressing who you are, articulating like kind of what your interests have been um, either inside your field or outside your field, how that has blended your identity together, um, finding your people, and that is our office. So um, I would like to think that our office is the first stop that a student would have um, to find uh, their place, to find that sense of belonging, um, and to just kind of explore who they are and the steps that you know, we have taken in the past and that I hope to um, rebuild and, and take uh, in the future are, are just more different experiences for the changing student, right? Um, so uh, whether it's a completely online student, a hybrid student, a non-traditional student, international student, whatever student, um, we want to meet them where they're at and give them the the opportunity to have more experiences um, that shape who they are. Uh, so I, I would say that's the also for equity piece um, that I'm excited about in my role as well. Thank you. When I think about the role that staff plays in belonging, we think about uh, recognition, recognition and acknowledgement for students, uh, reassurance that students belong here. We get um, that concern a lot from students with all different um, backgrounds and things going on, uh, reminders of the laws and their right to access the college, um, training opportunities and just opportunities to collaborate kind of across the community college, and then um, open, open conversations and guidance. So really helping students connect and um, have a place sort of to land sometimes. And that leads sort of right into our key roles and functions. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy support for students, so helping them um, speak up for themselves and gain some of those skills. Um, we ensure their confidentiality so that students know that they have a space where um, they can share information and know that it's not going to leave that space. Uh, we do a lot of connecting with resources that can provide additional supports and connection as well. So getting those students um, really connected. And then, as I said, just some areas with safe spaces for, for students to just come and be, um, or anybody else. So the Success Scholars Program helps students foster a sense of belonging by offering identity-based academic coaching and mentorship. So we know that the interpersonal relationships and positive interactions with uh, peers, faculty, and staff are crucial for fostering belonging, and that's what we are doing in the program. The professional staff consist of all members of our target population. And for those who don't know, success target population is Black, African American, Latinx, LGBTQ+, and Asian students, as well as the 40 mentors that we currently have that represent those identities as well. We know that when we have equity-minded practitioners from these backgrounds, it can help to challenge harmful stereotypes that the students might be facing. The other thing that we do is we combine with Maria's office and offer cultural programming and trips. Most recently, we took some students to New Orleans for the Black Students Lead Conference. They're actually going to be presenting next Tuesday at this time, their work, so I would love for all of you to attend that. And we partner again with Maria's office to advise the affinity groups. We have a group for Black males called Brotherhood. Black females called Sisterhood, and then we have the African Cultural Club, as well as Latinx Force. We have PRISM for our LGBTQ students. So basically, our program gives students the opportunity to build relationships with faculty, staff, and peers of similar background and experience who will help them with their sense of belonging. Thank you. So each of our panelists was provided the PRT data a few weeks ago. We asked each of them to read through the data and select a few of the emerging themes that their area focuses on 
and to share a few aha moments. So here's where we're gonna show you what our data shows. Um, Kayla, if you could share the slides again, please. And Maria, go ahead. Thanks, Christine. Um, and some I have two emergent themes that uh, came up for me, like uh, as far as for our area, and those were acceptance and community. And just to start for acceptance, um, Christine Capey enters up, or all of us were uh, three to four um, quotes, but I just could not choose um, because there, there was such rich data here. Um, and so one of the first ones that stood out to me um, probably resonated with me personally because my son is biracial and like I, I think about like how he would fit um, but like uh, someone being of mixed heritage um, not feeling connected as a whole and feeling like you have to split yourself or split your identity um, in many different ways especially um, as you're finding yourself in college and so uh, just where do I fit I, I am too um, black to be with my white friends too white to be with my black friends and just like even as we organize our organ like our our clubs our cultural background things like that um how do we have students feel like they fit more like they found their people um this one as well than having anxiety especially as an older student um feeling as an outcast um but you know this deciphering like uh, I, I'm fine being alone but really are you fine being alone because uh you know you don't feel like you've made yourself heard. Um, and even as a part-time student, um, we're finding that was really resonating with me to the data of like, you know, as our non-traditional student population will increase, um, how they are finding connections on our campus. Uh, so it's really intimidating to come back to, to college. And so um, how are we at the for forefront, um, making them feel like they are comfortable, like that they can make connections and that they are an asset to our community. Um, also, there were some great things, right? Like we we are amazing staff members. It's one of the things that brought me back to this community and why I feel like I belong. Um, so me like connecting with other students on different issues, but uh, their ability to share different viewpoints and like they are being heard. Um, and then just many more, many more, many more opportunities uh, that are geared towards uh, traditional students, but also non-traditional students and uh, folks that are here, maybe even purely online um, or part-time. Uh, what does your college experience look like? So these are the five quotes that from the data that really spoke to me, um, especially uh, for my area. And just thinking about um, what we have traditionally offered as college experience. Um, yes, you can join any type of club, but how do we involve different um, departments? Um, how are we involving uh, things that easy to connect with like sports. So on day two of my, um, I would even say day one uh, when I first returned back, I, I heard about the impact of sports um, it, from our office and how students really wanted to get involved. Um, and so that brought me back to this um, uh, next theme of community. Um, the, the ability to just like pick up a basketball, have the facilities. Um, I think the the big one was soccer that uh, people addressed me with first um, and just having my connection with UMass Lowell and knowing that uh, we had a kind of soft understanding with intramural sports, um, just bringing that up again. And so that that was like my day two task is to like talk with those folks to make that, that connection or reconnect. Um, having more different student events and activities and more kudos to students who are doing amazing things on campus um, just so that they inspire other students um, and that they can see themselves um, and, and their peers. Um, connecting as a fully online student, definitely possible. I think uh, we've evolved to a point where we know that that is possible to be feeling like you are an MCC student, even though you are online, feeling that your voice is heard, that your either your peers or faculty like understand the, either the field or the work that you've done um, and acknowledge that. Uh, so 
the, this next quote, like, you know, even living in Greenfield, right? They, they don't want to, it's not feasible for them to drive to every event. So how do we make an event um, feasible for a, an online student? Um, and then, you know, seeing more uh, events here on the quad, um, more things that you can do by chance, just walking into it um, and, and having more time together outside of class because that time outside of class, I don't know about you, I loved my classes uh, from community social psych, but I really remember just hanging out as a group uh, with my peers um, and, and those times that we kind of either bonded together, made a project together um, and, and the, that time outside of it where we were practicing the, the theories that we had learned um, inside the classroom. Uh, and so that's really my charge with um, uh, my role now in my office and uh, getting our, our team together to, to make sure that we have more of an array of uh, opportunities for our students to enjoy and get the college experience, or the, I should say the MCC college experience that we are renowned for. Um, so yes, thank you. So I... When um, I picked two emergent themes as well, so except and Maria and I overlapped for some of this, but you'll, you know, I think different perspective a little bit and then some shared perspective. We even picked one of the same quotes, but uh, highlighted one different part of it. Um, so, you know, I think when I was uh, reading through, really saw that what students are looking for is acknowledgement and understanding. They're looking for respect. Um, and so when we see sort of some of the statements about not feeling heard or um, not having enough ser services for people with disabilities or students feeling uncomfortable uh, because of their diagnoses and then sometimes just in general at the college, uh, you know, we like to take those opportunities to, to look at what we can do and what we are doing. And so um, because our office oversees accommodations as one of our big charges, right? Um, we, we often think about that as, uh, you know, a jumping off point to talk about how, you know, students have a legal right to access accommodations and that they shouldn't feel nervous or scared. They shouldn't feel like a burden for accessing those accommodations. Um, we thought kind of in some of the statements, but also we hear sometimes from students that they feel targeted or misunderstood. Um, and that assumption, they feel like assumptions, and we see sometimes that assumptions are being made, uh, which are harmful uh, because assumptions are almost always or always inaccurate. And so, assuming a student won't be able to do something because of an accommodation form just being in place really is unfair in a lot of ways. Um, so, we're always asking and talking about not assuming anything about a student, um, not assuming that a student in a, that's a wheelchair user has a cognitive disability, or assuming that a student who has no outward signs of mobility challenge, isn't a student that's in pain all the time. Um, so really not uh, taking kind of seeing an accommodation form and making any uh, pre kind of judge, you know, so putting those biases aside and um, really ensuring kind of that we're doing what we can to make those spaces um, accepting for students. And then the next area I picked um, to kind of focus on where some statements uh, really stood out was in that area of respect. And, you know, really the statements of students about learning about their disability. Um, there are many ways that students express wanting to feel just more respected at the college. Um, one way is a lot of students want to maintain their privacy related to having a diagnosis. Um, and so that information is not shared. We maintain their confidentiality. Um, but we also ask, you know, things like, if um, there's a conversation that's gonna happen that might give uh, give some of that information, even that a student has an accommodation, that it's done privately, that accommodation requests that involve others in a class are made generally. So essentially students aren't sort of being called out directly in that way, but that we're all doing that um, our part to maintain the students' private privacy and letting them share information that they wanna share only. Um, in addition to making sure that students have appropriate accommodations and are able to access them and then providing connections to the other resources on campus, our office is there to support faculty and staff as well as students in a whole bunch of areas in terms of understanding accommodations, related laws, gaining just general knowledge about different diagnoses and information about supporting students with a variety of learning styles 
and then about course design that is universally access accessible. So um, you can see from just even one of the statements that we kind of pulled out, but there were others um, in this last quote that students understand that there are ways that students that uh, classes can feel more accepting and feel more accessible and available. Um, and so, you know, this student in particular kind of talks about just breaking down information, ensuring instructions, expectations are clear. Um, about, you know, I think there's a kind of a charge in some of these statements from the students for us to um, to take some time to understand and to, to do a little bit of the work um, to, to grow and be better. Um, and then in terms of how to connect students, because faculty and student facing staff can often be someone that a student feels most comfortable confiding in, and because faculty could see something, read something, or hear something um, that really serves as an opening to provide support, our office relies on everybody to connect students with us. We're a small but mighty team, but small. Uh, we don't have kind of ears and eyes on every single thing that's going on. Um, and so, you know, we but we love to be involved. So, you know, having the someone from SAS come and present to a class or walking a student over to introduce them, doing an email, we love those two the best because those are kind of the face-to-face -face and handoffs ways in a way that is most effective. But even an email intro that's really direct are great ways to help students get connected with us. Um, and we ask everyone to, to take that role whenever you can. Thank you. So the one that really stood out to me the most was safety. And I, I don't mean like they feel safe walking through Lowell to get to campus. It's, it's safety being themselves and being who they are. I mean, the first quote that I chose, I am transgender, enough said. It's honestly devastating that someone feels that way. And so what can we do to help this student belong? The other two that... Um, have to go do with safety also are related to the LGBTQ population in terms of pronoun usage, um, a student hearing classmates making disparaging remarks. And I think the reason why the LGBTQ is the ones that stood out to me the most is, as I mentioned in the intro, I had other roles at Middlesex before joining Success. And the last one was Multicultural Affairs. Myself and Maria worked together. And just, you know, due to lack of resources, lack of personnel, it was just us two trying to service everybody. I always felt like we did not do proper service to the LGBTQ+. We didn't have enough to give to them. And so I was very happy when success came. And actually, when one of the success coaches, we had an opening, I asked Noreen, hey, can we make this coach an LGBTQ plus success coach? And of course she agreed and supported that and we were able to hire one that does just that. Um, we've taken a few trips, uh, New York City Pride. We took students to Cape Cod and P-Town last summer. So we're just trying to do as much as we can for this population in the success program to help them feel belonging. The other quotes that I chose in terms of feeling lost about not meeting the advisors, we have fantastic financial aid and academic advisors. They have large caseloads. That's the job. So the success coaches are able to get in there. Sorry, that's my timer. I use that trick from you, Arlene. Uh, we uh, were able to get in there and meet with the students, you know, that the advising can't get to, the financial aid they can't get to. We have smaller caseloads. So that's why that stuck out to me. And then not being able to keep up with work, schoolwork and paying tuition on time. Again, these are things our coaches can work on the students with. Sarah Tani is the financial wellness coach. She can help students make a budget. Uh, any of the coaches can help time management, study skills. And as you can see, the hardest part for me is Blackboard. It's like, it's not complicated things that are, you know, impacting these students. It's just very small things. And these are the types of things that the coaches work um, with the students on to just help them navigate college. And so we really need you to connect us with students you can email me directly any type of student that you think would benefit from success, and we're happy to help them. Thank you. Kayla, if you could stop sharing slides for a second. For this final question, I'm going to charge each of you if you could do it in a minute or less. Okay? So, given this data, 
we provided in our student climate survey, what are your goals for this upcoming year to positively impact a sense of belonging at MCC? So I will say I have some lofty goals. I, I would like to rebuild. I mean, I think every institution is rebuilding um, their engagement activities, but um, we we really are in a great spot where we have such willing folks. Um, and I will say like, you know, I, I know I'm a month in, I, I have a new hire that is um, shortly after me, but like we are going in and looking at our structures and looking at um, how we have done things that have really worked well, but how we can make those models really work well for the evolving student. Um, so that is my very short minute goal, but like if we want to dive into it, I'm happy to share with anybody um, what our, our strategies are, especially for sense of belonging. Um, I feel like I just jumped back right into like the work, um, uh, but I, I will share that, you know, we have a group of academic and um, student engagement or student affairs folks that are getting together. Um, so I will plug that to say, you know, we're meeting every other Friday um, and, and really sharing how we can do programming differently for the fall um, and what things are missing and, who, and whoever needs to be at the table, I, I invite you there. So um, that that's my goal for this. All right. Our goals uh, for this year in SAS are really centered around um, one that we're going to have more data and easier systems for accessing information about um, accommodations and what's working for students with varying diagnoses and not. Um, and so our plan is to provide more resources, more trainings, uh, more outreach for faculty and staff for local high schools and programs and for prospective current and returning students. How's that, Christine? <laughs> My goal, very simple. Uh, we want to reach more students. We've reached over 500 students the last few semesters, and that's fantastic, but there are many, many more out there, so we need to get to them. So in order to do that, I need the help from all of you, especially professors. You see the students multiple times per week. Again, email me names. You can show up at my door like Professor Dark Kathios does. You can call me. You, I don't care. Give me the name so we can get in front of these students and get them connected. Thank you. We so appreciate all of you. Thank you, panelists, for taking the time with us today. Um, if you can stay on, we will have some questions at the end, and we greatly appreciate your time. All right, so we have covered um, a lot in a little bit of time here. Um, we've discussed some um, uh, some ways to make uh, belonging impactful and connections here on campus. So let's talk about leveraging action and how we can make these things actionable. Um, we uh, can cover that you know there's low hanging fruit um, from the emergent themes. We can see that there are um, instances where students would just like clearer communication. Um, and then really a, an important theme that uh, a key takeaway that the PRT team really walked out of this data with is um, staying nimble, being sure that we're getting a, a read on the student climate and being able to um, pivot and adjust our policies, our procedures, the way we're working with students that we're encouraging a connection. Um, you know, we need to keep uh, responding to our enrolling population's unique needs at, in our data over and over again, adult, adult learners, adult learners, um, you know, that mass reconnect population, they're here. And uh, so we need to start thinking about what, what does belonging look like for them and how do we um, impact our non-traditional learners in a way that, uh, you know, when they're struggling to make connections with other students and faculty, how we can help combat some of those feelings of isolation, um, isolation from peers and their community, discrimination, feeling like an outsider, um, or feeling like they're being judged in the classroom or um, at, you know, just every day on campus. Um, the isolation and the anxieties that some students are really struggling with, it's really eye-opening. Uh, when going through some of these narrative responses, it was very difficult for the team and I to um, you know, separate out what we needed to do and just not have so much empathy for these students and get stuck on some of these themes because they were really powerful. And the, just the number of responses we got back was just, um, it was really eye-opening. 
So, you know, we're aiming and our goal for the next academic year as the PR team moves ahead is, you know, we're aiming for excellence. We're hoping to really make a high impact um, with our distance learners, with our adult learners, and, and really pushing that need for connection and that relationship rich environment that Winnie spoke about. Um, we have this uh, population of distance learners. Right now, uh, it's really great in higher ed. There's so much data coming out about cultivating community and distance learners. So it's, you know, we really ask that folks start thinking about how we can engage these learners inside the classroom, but also outside of it, um, how we can start to cultivate a sense of community for our distance learners. Um, they can take online classes anywhere in the state. They can take online classes. You know, I know that there are like Harvard Coursera classes taught right now at X cost that are really appealing. You know, the only tool we have in our on our toolbox is just that amazing connection, the environment we have here at MCC, um, the stories that you hear from past students. That's what we really have in our toolbox and what we really, really want to push going into the next academic year. So we ask, you know, uh, to challenge you for the next, um, for 2024, 2025, is that as we move into divisional and staff meetings or retreats, maybe some goal setting, which involves discussions around how to include themes of belonging um, or training in, in your offices, and starting to think about different populations that we now have at Middlesex. Um, this data is available, IR publishes the IR website that has some, some trends on student um, enrollment. Um, and how we can tailor our services to really uh, create opportunities to connect with these students. Um, maybe partner with your PRT staff cohorts to have a discussion on best practices um, or seek out some professional development opportunities. I've asked um, Peter Shea to be a resource and he is going to speak in just a moment about some of the resources and opportunities that he could assist you or your office in obtaining. Um, to help foster this sense of belonging among your team and coworkers, as well as connecting with students. Um, there's a very real practical application of cultivating a sense of belonging and connection with your peers and your colleagues that we're not even going to get into in this presentation, but it's a very real um, tested and, and researched approach at retaining talent. So um, we'll, we'll keep it to just the students with this round. Um, but really taking action to obtain those resources could really start to, you know, kickstart belonging at the institution and within your own office. So uh, the last piece that I really want to plug is small changes are, are really what keep this possible and uh, what keep it actionable. So, you know, striking up a conversation with a student in an elevator, facilitating a warm handoff. So not just telling a student if you have the capacity, you know, not just telling a student Oh, you need to speak with financial aid, but really making a call or an email or an attempt to bring the student there and introducing them or smiling, giving them your card so that they know that they can come back to you um, should they have any more questions. There's some really great uh, staff resources we have on campus for this. Um, and, you know, putting those into practice every day, um, you can be the change. You can be the one that a student connects to or maybe multiple students connect to. You see this across campus. I can think of Vera. I can think of Susan Fredrickson. They have these groups of followers, students that come back to them time and time again. And that's really, that's what sets us apart from other institutions. So first, I'm going to ask Peter to briefly talk about um, some of the resources you can take advantage of out of the um, professional development side of the house. So Peter is the Director of Professional and Instructional Development. Um, and then after him, Maria Garapi, Executive Director of DEI and Belonging, is going to briefly talk about resources and trainings that um, she also has to offer from her, her area. So, Peter, if you are up and you want to start. I am. Thanks, Kayla. Um, again, uh, hi, everyone. I just want to do a quick reminder of the resources that my office offers. And I also want to emphasize that at Middlesex, our model of professional development has always been centered on building communities of practice. So. The idea of developing a sense of belonging and support of community has always been at the heart of our model. Um, as many of you know, we have um, annual PD funding opportunities available for our employees, full and part-time, and that you can apply for them. 
uh, online through my office, and you'll get a quick response. Um, we have communities of practice for admins, for staff assistants, and for managers. And uh, this summer, we're going to be working on creating a summer institute um, uh, for people who are interested in how artificial intelligence is going to impact education. Um, and I, you know, we'll be getting a conversation with uh, Carrie and Willie um, next week on a potentially supporting an institute um, for people interested in East Asian studies. So again, we really like to encourage people to talk to one another, and PD is here to support that. Um, we have the AQ course on um, AI and education, which is a nationally recognized certification, and we encourage faculty and staff who are interested to reach out to me. And of course, we have our 24-7 LinkedIn Learning Library available to employees through MyMCC, which um, has thousands and thousands of incredibly useful courses on professional development, including those extending to creating community, belonging, and communication. Um, so I encourage everyone to take a look at those. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel, please, please feel free to reach out to my office. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Maria? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in, um, here for a couple of minutes. Actually, let me start my timer because that would be best. <laughs> uh, so thank you for sharing this slide. I'm going to start by mentioning that in addition to today's critical conversation, conversation, there will be one on April 30 that will also focus on a couple of the campus-wide surveys that went out prior to my arrival to the campus. Uh, some of you know those as the CC and CCSE surveys. Uh, we will be presenting those findings in a way <clears throat> that is for consumption of the entire campus constituents. So please save the date, <laughs> excuse me, for April 30th. Uh, we will be sending um, an invite later on, but we want to make sure that that's on everyone's um, calendars. The Madan Sara documentary is something we're working on with the Latinx Community Center for Empowerment. This is something that you know we've been planning. Hopefully we have a good showing of employees and also students. And it's going to be focusing on the experiences and the role, the leadership role that Madan Sara has taken many countries throughout the Caribbean um, as community leaders that put at this fore and center the education of their children um, in the work that they do every day. Uh, so we're gonna have that next Wednesday, February 28th at 5.30 at the Academic Arts Center. If you have not registered, could you please scan that QR code? That's where that will take you so that we have um, a head count that's a bit accurate. Um, also, the Racial Healing Circle facilitators met for um, met last week. We will be having up more upcoming gatherings. So if you are a facilitator who may or may not have been training, <clears throat> excuse me, who may or may not have been facilitating over the last several months, you're welcome to attend, um, we're looking for people to, you know, to really race to the opportunity to co-facilitate, even for those who may not have recent experiences, we can pair you with a more advanced facilitator. Uh, for that, we're also going to have a Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Institute in June from the 25th through the 28th. And if you are interested, please let me know. It doesn't need to be for only for people who've done it. If you haven't done it, you're welcome to attend. Um, so that will be coming up. There's going to be a data campaign with human resources where we're going to be encouraging self-reporting. So look more into that. There's not enough time for me today to go over this, but these these are conversations that are very important. The same way that um, you know that we need to look at the data on the student side, we need to do that campus wide, and that includes employees. And so that's why the affinity spaces that are coming up for BIPOC employees and for the LGBTQ plus on the 27th and the 28th of March are important. So if you are a, uh, excuse me, a supervisor, please make sure you encourage your employees to attend. Some more resources and tools that we can be working on together. Many of you are aware of racial healing circles. You know, if you have the need for it, please reach out to myself. Okay, that's my timer, so let me wrap it up. Uh, please reach out to Virak or myself. The affinity spaces that I mentioned and more than we can develop. If you're an employee and you have interested for an identity or allyship based affinity space, do reach out. Um, I won't get too much into disaggregating data, but where you see existing tools for intentional policy review, syllabus, observational tools, and other practices, 
it's what this presentation today has been focusing on, right? So aside from that sense of belonging, how do we keep my that mindset going and that growth mindset? Uh, really, what what it belongs is to constantly looking at your practice and how can we continuously center equity mindedness in everything we do. The work of Reggie includes a lot of video options that we have had access to and that are publicly available. So we can review that and revisit a little bit closely. Uh, same with the shared equity leadership models that are out there and that the current, excuse me, the current cohort of Reggie has been looking into a little bit more closely. So please do reach out. You have my contact information. I don't know if it's another slide there. Yep. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Peter and Maria. Um, our PRT staff cohort believes in the collective staff efficacy, right? When a staff shares the belief that through their collective actions, they can positively influence students' outcomes and student achievement success. And the student succeeds at the student achievement increases. That relentless welcome, right? That ongoing authentic commitment that every single time you meet a student, every single time you interact with them, you give them that moment. If you have an interest in this type of work, you can see on the slide, they'll be opening the third Pedagogy of Real Talk staff cohort to begin training in June 2024. Please keep an eye out on Newscaster for any announcements to submit an application. And just a final thank you. We want to express our gratitude to all the folks who came today, also the ones that left their conference to be part of our panel and to be all part of with the senior leadership for allowing us this platform and to our panel of MCC resources and internal resources who helped us today. Thank you very much. The chat is now open. And if there's any questions or comments. Thank you for today's presentation. Um, as Christine said, chat is now open. You also can raise your hand if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. I'm just scrolling through the screens. I don't see any hands raised. Beth, that's usually a sign of an amazing presentation. That's exactly. Very Let me applaud all of our uh, presenters today. I I'm really grateful for the time and energy um, that people have put in. We, we have, if you know of folks who were not able to be with us today, we just want to remind you that all of these will be taped. Um, I I want to point out a couple of things that are really important because I think you're beginning to see in the chat people's responses to this. No, number one, this work is ongoing and it it is, you know, it's happening in our faculty with the Faculty Academy. It's happening with the staff work. It's happening with PRT. Um, and I couldn't be prouder of the work. Uh, if you are sitting somewhere in the institution, you feel like you don't fit into one of those categories, we assure you that the staff welcomes your participation uh, in the staff PRT work uh, and, and can enter, you can enter through that third cohort. Um, what is so valuable about all this and what you saw today is that we are doing exactly what the institution needs to do and promise to do in its strategic plan. And that is to begin to center student voices. Any survey that has a 44% response rate is one that needs to be paid attention to. It's incredibly important for us to hear from our students, for them to be as frank as they have been in all of this and sharing some of those comments are not comments that are easy for any of us to hear because no one wants any of our students to feel like they don't belong or that they're suffering in any way, but it's more important for us to have an open and honest dialogue about ways we can all participate. So. I just want to take a moment to say that Peter is not only a resource in everything that he's mentioned, as is Maria, but Peter has just uh, ordered some more Pedagogy of Real Talk books. So if you feel like reading the book might give you an entrance into it, it's a short read, actually. And while it is very focused on, on teaching and learning, uh, I think you will see yourself as a member of the staff and faculty in what you can contribute through the work that Paul has put together. And I wanna thank you, even though Paul could not be with us today, 
I want to thank Paul for his incredible dedication to our institution and all our cohorts. He continues to be um, philosophically and both logistically a real support for all of this work at the institution that makes us really proud. And all of that was recognized in the American Association of Community Colleges Award. So uh, I see a hand, Vikram. Yeah, I'd also like to uh, make a pitch here. Uh, you'll be getting an email from Arlene's office for the Faculty Academy, uh, which will also begin in June, along with the Staff Academy. And uh, we'll be having it at our Lowell campus for the first year. And for the following years, it will all be virtual. So if any faculty members are interested, please reach out to me, Lara, Benor, or Heloisa. We are the faculty leads in our respective cohorts. Uh, or, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. But uh, you will be getting an email out from Arlene's office uh, regarding the faculty cohort as well down the road. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I just want to mention one of the pieces that Caleb talked about today, and I think you heard this theme about as we embrace mass reconnect and students who are over the age of 25 or adults returning to our institution. If you read the Chronicle of Higher Education, there was a good lead article about adults returning um, and what they're experiencing. And what is really remarkable at some places is that, you know, we've done all this recruitment to bring these adults back and finish their certificate or associate's degree. The challenge is for all of us, and I think we've met that challenge, is that many of those adults are not returning to the same institution that they were not successful in. Because I think we've learned a lot and they learned a lot. And I think if, if we can apply what we're talking about here to our everyday interactions, as, as Christine has identified, and the importance of our interaction with students and making them feel like they belong, every single individual that works at this institution changes that climate every day for our students so that they feel they're part of something and that they can be successful. Um, we will need to continue to learn and grow in this work. Um, and unless anyone has any further comments or questions, I just wanna applaud the panel and the presenters today for the incredible work, for all of the folks who have been engaged in PRT work, which is really phenomenal at this scale, at this institution. We're very grateful for your commitment to the work. I thank you all for taking time on a week where you have both, you know, FSA and, and a critical conversation in the same week, which means a lot of time for us all to be together. But I'm very grateful for your commitment to this work and to the institution. We wish you well, and we'll see you on Thursday at FSA. <laughs>